I'm calling the Kittitas County Public Hospital District number one uh, Board of Commissioners meeting to order. It's uh, January 4th, 2024. This is our December meeting uh, that was re rescheduled to uh, early January. Um, do we need a uh, roll call, Mandy, or you, or you got it? I'm good if you guys are good. All right. So let's uh, start with the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or changes to the agenda? Okay, uh, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the agenda, please say aye. All right. Oh, yeah, I guess we need a motion. I'll move to second. Thank you. All right, all those in, in favor of the agenda, please say aye. 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 On the consent agenda, aye. I did make uh, one um, minor change to the minutes from our uh, November 30th meeting just to uh, reflect the actual language of the uh, of the law about uh, substantially equivalent uh, termination services. Uh, just uh, it really is just a quotation from the, from the letter uh, just to reflect that. It's a very minor change where it says substantial equivalence. I think I changed. I had it changed to substantially equivalent. Anyway, is that, is that not currently reflected on our paper document? Substantial. Well, no, it's not currently reflected. And so where is that? It's where uh, we find it. It's where we talk about. Uh, so page page four of the packet, but page two of the minutes uh, at the very top there, about five lines down, provides substantial equivalent termination states. I just changed that to substantially equivalent and uh, in quotation marks to reflect the actual letter itself. Thank you. Are there any, uh, uh, any other changes or anything to the minutes, anything on the consent agenda that needs to be pulled? Accept the consent agenda. Okay, Bob moves to accept the consent agenda with that minor revision to the to the minutes. Second. Second from Erica. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. aye. Thanks, Dr. O'Brien. Uh, all right. Next up, we have public comment and announcements. That's the time. If anyone has a, a public comment or announcement, please try to keep it to about three minutes. Please begin by stating your uh, name and uh, where from. And uh, remember that the board does not respond to public comments and announcements during the during the board meeting itself. Is there anyone here who would like to make a public comment or announcement? Yes. Yes. Uh, please uh, state your name. Hi, my name is Joan Bennett, and I worked here starting in 2006 when Eric Jensen uh, was the CEO. And uh, I want to, I worked here for 15 years in the laboratory on the night shift. And there were some concerning things that happened in the lab. I, uh, and I want to tell the board how grateful I am for you, for your dedication and for your willingness to listen to me. I really appreciated that. And I also want to ask, according to your October statement that you're going to improve public access to the board. I'd like you to please um, consider how you might be able to make yourselves more available to the public. Um, not necessarily through uh, the KBH facilities, but through announcement in the newspaper and on public uh, public facilities, perhaps. Um, and I just want to thank you again. I'm grateful for all of you there and uh, for your dedication and for your attempts to improve, improve KBH. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any additional uh, public comments or announcements? The only thing I'll add is a note of congratulations to John Ward uh, on his win in the in the uh, election this fall. Thank you. Uh, welcome. Congratulations. Any other public comments? All right. Thank you. Let's move on then. Start uh, with quality. Uh, Mandy Olson, Chief Quality Officer. 
My report is starting on page 12. Um, I'd like to comment on um, we are seeing lots of respiratory illness circulating right now. Lots of RSV, influenza, COVID, parent influenza, uh, lots of respiratory uh, illness. And so um, KBH has a uh, Signal that staff should be wearing face masks when they're in inpatient care areas. Um, protect patients and themselves. That's in and above the normal PPE that staff should be wearing when they um, have patients that have a known respiratory illness. Um, so that started um, just a, a week ago. Um, Andy, did we settle on language that was consistent with what Dr. Larson wanted? And it was should. Should said, instead of um, staff should be wearing face masks or respirators in all patient 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 facing areas. And, and Mandy, how are we seeing that reflected? Is that like people show up in the ER, people at the clinic visits? Is our census up in the hospital? How are we determining this rise? We're very busy. Um, I, the rise. So Anna Scarlett in infection control reviews lab results every single day. She looks at all of those uh, panels that they do testing patients in all settings. So it's um, any of our results on those tests she's looking at and then looking at the setting we're in. Um, that also comes from reports of our employees uh, who call in and, and say they're sick and, and what kind of illnesses they have. That's what we're also getting. At. In addition to that, the last two weeks of December, um, I would tell you that probably 80% of the patients who were there were here for a respiratory issue of some kind. It was it into the hospital yes, for overnight yes, or transfer? We had we had multiple. We had at one time we had we had two COVID positives on the floor. The rest were influenza A and B and pneumonia. So we had a whole smorgasbord of respiratory illness. And so the for those last two weeks of December, the acuity is moderately serious. I mean, these are people that need they're, they're, oxygen or yeah, other they were ill, and some did actually get discharged home on oxygen. It wasn't the severity of COVID that we had previously known in 2020 and 2021, but I mean, they were still respiratorily compromised, absolutely. And, and we're on an upswing. I mean, we haven't seen the peak yet for this. I can't. I tell. just talked to Anna. Like, I don't know until afterwards. Ago. Yeah, she was just leaving the hospital. I, I was just at a meeting with Anna. We talked about this, and she said the COVID numbers are actually not um, at the moment mm -hmm. going up. It's really more um, uh, uh, influenza A and the RSV that she's seeing more of an increase at currently. So we did. We had to transfer a couple of uh, children, children, um, and we had to uh, transfer some adults related to influenza and COVID. So um, what, the other thing we've seen is patients previously who uh, had positive tests for COVID like a month ago are now back with pneumonia or other illnesses that, you know, is this because of COVID previously that yeah. now they're not able to recover from other things. What are the testing options for RSV? Is that generally only if somebody is so it has to be prescribed, but we, we don't have free testing or uh, it's not patient clinic phase. Though. Is it only? Uh, I think there is. There the is clinic phase testing yeah. okay. as well. Mm -hmm. um, there's been issues with CMS um, around the BioFire uh, 22 antigen panel, which CMS has, defined, has deemed is not ever necessary in an outpatient setting. Including back when that was the only test that we had that we could use in a timely fashion to get people transferred. Um, so uh, that's been a, a frustration. But is that where Medicare clawed back some of that money and just said that was not acceptable, even though it's not logical what they're saying? Precisely. Okay. Um, but uh, we do have quadrivalent tests uh, that similar technology. Uh, CMS deemed that uh, any test for more than five. Pathogens probably inappropriate. I don't know where that came from. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Um, so at this point, we do have other testing options. They are accessible from just about any setting. Um, we don't have the turnaround from the clinic because there's transport, but uh, for in house, it's my understanding is it's about an hour. 
Thank you. Rose Bob Casino. And the <laughs> clinics do have point of care testing for both influenza A and B and RSV available in the clinic setting too. Okay. And is RSV transmitted human to human when it's contagious? Oh, very. Yes. Okay. yes. Um, uh, just released was an RSV vaccine for adults over 60, um, which turned out to be a significant reservoir. A lot of the quote unquote COPD exacerbations we've seen over the years we're now recognizing are probably viruses that we just didn't have the technology to readily identify. Um, that's uh, RSV, human metanumavirus, um, uh, even some coronaviruses that aren't uh, SARS CoV 2. Um, but yeah, I, some of the highest hospital volumes I've ever been involved with over my career were in RSV season. And, uh, in Cleveland, we filled a pediatric hospital one night. But it typically peaks. Is there a typical peak? It's a winter. It, um, that particular year in Ohio. The season started in February, which is more where when we typically see influenza in the Northwest. The last few years, we've had earlier seasons than that. Uh, and this year is shaping up to be one of those. Okay. Do you have other questions? To, I mean, is there anything else you'd like to call out uh, with Mandy's report? Before we talk about the QI or the clocking. I don't think I have any other. Anybody have any uh, thing on the dashboard or anything before we go to the clocking? All right. Well, people are eager to get to the clocking plans. Now, you guys remember the process that. Uh, Done with this, uh, Mandy. Maybe you want to just, you wouldn't mind just walking people through the, the timeline. So, uh, when did it get to us uh, for feedback? When it got to QI Council, and, and who saw it before QI? Well, even go back further than that and remind you that we did, you did strategy refresh right in, in June and said, what are we focusing on? What do we need to look at? We incorporated that into our reflection that we did in August when we got together and said, how's it going with what we're working on? Where are we at? What services have changed? What are we doing? Um, and Julie helped us think about, too, how can we, instead of having strategy and coffee, why, why shouldn't these two things align? And so if we <coughs> don't have to have individual coffee plans at each department, Every department needs to be working towards copy, working towards improvement, but they don't have to have their own individual plans. So instead, we looked at what are the broader things that we're trying to improve from strategy perspective, and let's have that be the focus of copy, of copy plans that everyone's going to work together on. Um, so there are those were drafted in, in September, um, and those uh, drafts came to QI Council in October. Uh, they were also sent to the board for feedback um, and uh, leaders went to their staff too and talked with them about it, uh, worked together on them. So those final drafts came to QI Council in December and QI Council then its recommendation to the board about whether they approve these plans. And uh, as you guys, as Mandy mentioned, the format of this is much different than it was last year. That's not only because of we think strategically it's better, but also because we think that this, I mean, you can help me here because we think that this will be better for the accreditation process, not accreditation. What is it? What um, is yes. It? Yeah. So when, when they were surveyed to make sure that we're, um, I, I think it's easier for all of us to kind of head in the same direction um, instead of working on their pet projects or, um, and there's better visibility. The uh, accreditation bodies want to see that the governing body has oversight of these copy plans, and this will allow for that more cohesive um, reporting structure. I think so too. And I think 
it just felt really good too. I don't, Julie, you made a comment at the end of the session about or how it seemed like everyone was really excited to like, this is what I think we need to do to, to move on this. And it didn't seem like extra work or work they weren't already planning to do. It was like, oh yeah, this is what we need to be doing right now. And um, so I think there's a lot of benefits to changing it to this process. Yeah, last time, as you guys may remember, it was just a huge laundry list. Mm -hmm. 69. And this is, uh, yeah, this is much, uh, this makes much more sense in terms of strategic planning. I don't believe it's any less work, just to be clear. <laughs> well, and we have sort of the other duties as a sign, right. which is where the department each have their own work that they've dedicated themselves to and identified metrics. Um, but in, and within that, um, one of the things Mandy and I have been wrestling with is uh, DNV uh, is trying to mold or reshape our reporting structure to QI to make sure that it's operations themselves that are having an opportunity to come before Quality Improvement Council, the board. And so Mandy's put together a schedule of sort of workshop and then Quality Improvement Council, workshop and Quality Improvement Council. So that council will start to see more of the operations folks actually delivering the message about the quality improvement. That's Mandy. We'll see if I can let go. <laughs> we're, we're here to help. Yeah. So do you guys have any uh, <laughs> any uh, anything you want Mandy to, to explain? And we've looked at these, I mean, I being on the QI council have looked at this. I think it's excellent. I appreciate the effort clearly that have gone into getting this clarified and organized in a way, like you said, that uh, makes uh, achieving these goals so much more straightforward. And so. I don't know. Sorry. We, I don't no, please. Yeah. I don't know if it has this effect for others, but in just my own perspective of it, I feel like it just really brings it to focus how it all interrelates. And, um, yeah, I find it probably helps outside, but not with my hands in the work. In the past, it's um, to find the connection and understanding of how, how they um, intersect. But this is, I really like this pretty highly together. Anything else before I, we entertain a motion? Okay. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? Yeah, brilliant, br brilliant. Just Dr. saying Ryan. that's brilliant work. Okay. I, mean, I just wanted to say that's brilliant work. I just have one more comment. Sure. Um, a couple of the thing I did miss was the, uh, the block on current state or problem statement. A couple of them don't have that. I was just curious as to why some issues didn't need that statement. For instance, the uh, Oracle optimization. As far as I see, does not have. It's on the second page. Oh, it's, oh, oh, nice. Oh, it's okay. longer. Than so to be continued at the bottom of that. <laughs> it's not good. All right, good. Yeah, I tried right. to. I, I really did try to have some consistent formatting, like page X of X, because I know that that is helpful. But we uh, we can work on that. Okay. For our copy format and good. Thank you. Oh. I would move to approve the copy. All right, thank you, uh, Terry. Second uh, from yeah. Second. All right, second from Erica. Any further discussion? All those in favor of approving the 2024 copy plans, please say aye. 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 Uh, thank you very much for all the work uh, you've done on this, Mandy, and everybody else who's done on this already, and we look forward to hearing about the work you've done to do that, all this stuff. So I'll, uh, as we move on to the 2024 QI measures, I'll just say what Mandy is already thinking, and that is they're measuring lots of things, not just the stuff that's on this list. Okay. <laughs> so this is just about uh, what is going to be on the monthly QI dashboard, what's going to be on the annual QI report, what's going to be on, you know, what's going to come to the board. Okay. Um, do you want to... Just uh, remind us, please. Oh, I see. So you have the color key at the bottom. 
but which are new measures which are reported to the board annually, which are on the QI dashboard monthly, and what uh, they recommend discontinue reporting to the board through the QI council. Uh, the only thing discontinued is compliance concerns reported. Um, but uh, there are some new measures, and then uh, all this stuff, of course, and more is available to any board member who would like to go to uh, to the quality department and and uh, have them open up their uh, the numbers to you. Uh, Mandy, uh, do you want to just sort of say a little more about what's going on here? Sure, I do want to mention this is slightly different format than previous years, it's still a list like before, but I didn't have that DNB DOH required or recommended in the past. I want to be really clear about that because DNB does have 22 topics where they are really specific. You must measure this thing or, uh, or they're bit, you know, you have to uh, measure anesthesia here, right? And so um, they, they want the governing board to have oversight. That can happen through QI council. Um, but I do think there's value in having a dashboard where the board itself directly can see over time how we're doing on some specific measures. So I don't think it should all stay at QI Council. Um, so some of these, though, don't make sense to measure that aren't currently on the dashboard, but we're required to measure and have governance oversight. Don't make sense to be on a run chart like um, wrong site surgeries. That is something we have to measure. Well. That's really a never event. And so you'd have a graph with zeros all the way across. It makes more sense for the surgery anesthesia department to make a report to QI Council uh, annually about an aggregate data, talk about the trends they've seen or, or what they're looking for, um, and provide that report to QI Council. Um, so that's where some of these they say annually, and that's that new process of that QI workshop prior to QI Council, and then um, operational leaders coming and reporting to QI Council about some of those uh, measures that they're, and, and, and it really is at least annually that they need to be reviewed or um, measured. So um, that that is something different this year, that this is not, not every single one of these will show up on, on the dashboard each month. So are you are you saying some of these things will be handled at the committee level as far as oversight? Okay. At QI Council. The leader here, if I recall correctly, the concern there was that there was a confidentiality. Yes, when you get with really small numbers. Okay. Uh, so if there was an interest in something, and this has happened before, something's the the board feels like board members on QI Council would like to come to the board meeting. We just have to be careful how we um, line some of it or do it in executive session. Okay. Which quality improvement work is uh, can be part of the executive session. Any other questions about the uh, proposed QI measures? Could you just uh, say one more thing about how you how you decided on which ones? I mean, you you mentioned as an example the wrong site uh, procedure. Um, I remember you get sort of feedback from people. We'd like to see this uh, more often. We uh, annually is good. Uh, so you get input from from different yeah. people. I start first with what's required. Right. That's that's what we must measure. We must do. Um, to the quapies too. So some of the measures that are on here came directly from quapies saying, we think this needs to be on here. We need to have oversight of it on a more frequent cadence. Um, and then, yeah, I meet with separate teams who say, um, like, uh, stroke or step sepsis or STEMI. That's a group where they're saying, you know, we're, we've really done a great job with, I don't know, TPA timing or something. And so we think we should, we should be looking at this other piece more closely this year. That's the part we want to improve on more. Uh, home health and hospice is another place where they kind of pick specific measures that they'd like to work on. Um, so I'd like to do that more next year. Um, some of these are our measures are a little bit new as far as the reporting structure. And um, so we're going to have to spend some time together talking about what that annual report looks like. Um, so 
we'll be talking more. But yeah, it's it's a collaborative process. Thank you. Any uh, any additional questions uh, before we entertain a motion of the 2024 QI measures? <clears throat> All right. Do I have a motion to approve the 2024 QI measures? So moved. All right. Second motion. from Bob. Second from John. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the 2024 QI measures, please say aye. Hi. Thank you. Anything else for Mandy? Anything, Mandy? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for all the work you've been doing. I thank you for continuing to uh, run the best dang committee at the hospital. <laughs> all right. Um, let's move on then. The CEO reports. Uh, Julie Hughes. Yeah. Just um, uh, updates on some things I think you've already heard about. We are. Um, the Department of Health has challenged the hospital's ability to geographically limit the financial assistance that is provided to patients. So this has been a longstanding policy in our in some hospitals. Our hospital does not, in fact, say you have to live within Hospital District One in City Pass County, but some hospitals do that. Um, that's been an acceptable practice for years and years in Washington State and. The Department of Health and the Attorney General's Office this year has challenged that. Tomorrow morning, the Washington State Hospital Association will be arguing before the uh, Thurston County Superior Court for summary judgment to have that overturned. The implications of that are some of the very large specialty centers like Children's Hospital and the University of Washington Harbor Harbor U Harbor U Medical Center are that you'll have an influx of people from around the world without resources who will come for services that, that those institutions need to be able to prioritize when they're not going to be able to. So again, the policies that have been submitted and approved by the state year after year have included uh, geographic restrictions and they're saying no, they're not going to allow that. So we'll know more tomorrow whether the court will uh, just issue summary judgment and take us back to where we were. There are implications for border communities like Newport and Spokane hospitals around reproductive health care, given um, the situation in Idaho is driving patients from Idaho over to Spokane, so they're trying to avoid that issue at the same time. So we've got that going on tomorrow morning. Um, charity care in itself, there was some uh, organization that is a patient advocacy group that did some uh, surveying of the 102 hospitals in Washington State and whether we were in compliance with the charity care regulations with regard to posting them on our website, how we make them available, what we were screening for. Um, their survey, the students from the University of Washington and their survey was just riddled with errors. Um, our information was in error. Um, so I think, uh, Jason, you're going to respond to the folks that are leading this charge around charity care. Again, the state of Washington vastly expanded who charity care is available to a couple of years ago. So we went through all of our policies, all of our postings, and made sure that they were up to date and accurate. So I'm confident that what we have out there and what we've been trying Accurate, but um, these folks are, are looking for more of that. That number has exponentially grown over this. Let me say year. that nine hundred thousand dollars. So a family of four qualifies for discounts at ninety thousand dollars. But is that? But is that due to? No. So that's due to increased demand, or is that due to decrease? Uh, uh, decreased uh, compensation uh, part of payers. Do you understand what I mean? Financial assistance due to increased ability that we're required to offer for that. Which is also incentive to not get Medicaid coverage. Right. I, I guess. Uh, I guess what I'm wondering is. Maybe maybe this question has been answered already, but is it that there's more demand for charity care or that this is 
Well, so there's more demand for services from people who now qualify for charity. There's more demand for services from people who get charity care or just the same level of demand, but uh, more stuff being considered charity care. Do you, do you understand the question? That's it's probably both. I mean, demand plus our, our total volume is up as well. So you have some proportional increase just with that. Just demand is up in general. That was demand up just for those who qualify for that financial assistance potentially. Yeah, so it's, it's not like, uh, I guess the question I'm asking is, it's not like people are realize that they can get charity care and are just sort of flocking here in droves. It's that they would be here anyway, but currently that's not being covered. Um, is that right? Yeah, I think they'd be here. Um, some of the increase could also be to expanding our service types. So like with our vascular type medicine, it, it may have, certain services can attract those populations. Okay. Security care apply to all services? Yeah. I have question. <laughs> oh, you said that some of them might not be some who qualify for charity care may be disincentivized from from we don't have as much incentive six one half dozen of another to sign up for Medicaid or other programs that they might qualify for. Can there be a criteria that they at least try that before charity care is extended? We always try to enroll people in the Medicaid. Uh, we don't always qualify. So, so charity care. Financial assistance is considered a resource of last resort. So you can require that they apply for Medicaid okay. and, and require for, uh, that they apply for VA benefits and things like that and be rejected before you extend financial assistance. Okay. But, but the way the law was written, it also incentivizes people, even if they go to the Washington Health Plan Finder to get insurance, to choose the highest deductible plan. So they have catastrophic coverage, especially if they're outside of Washington State. So they're having lower premiums, but then the premium, yeah, but they're so fourteen thousand out of the pocket max or whatever. Is if they again, it's, it's only eighteen months old, but I think it's still sweet because people train their neighbors and their friends and they're out chatting. Hey, do you realize if you go get this knee surgery, you have a high deductible plan. You can just tell KBH when the rest of the bill comes in. I qualify for this. So it's going to be a, a challenge because it's essentially an unfunded mandate <laughs> with, a, yeah. with no cap on what it could eventually cost us. And for those going to Olympia, it's another thing you could throw in conversation this month. So. Some are very large, like 150,000. I mean, all of last year, we were, we were around 200,000 all of last year. Yeah. Where are you? Uh, Exactly. It's about a million, I think, now or like So not the end of 2023, but 2022. We projected an increase of 900,000, yeah. I think, 23 yeah. over 22. Yeah, 21 and 22 were 1.2 million, and 2023 were 2 million. And then, like, you're saying there's no residency requirement. They don't have to be Washington State residents, Kevin Towns residents. They just have to get here and get service yeah. in Washington. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. So it's. Services that are covered. I was thinking um, about the events wrong. I want to say the vascular, there's a aesthetic vascular procedure that's going online that's um, getting rid of spider beans. That something like that, charity care eligible, or does it need to be something that is? Medically. Yeah, okay. it's not medically necessary. Okay. It'd be enough to pick up. Do we have to catch that ahead of time? Yeah. So like dermatology is a good example. Go to an appointment, they'll look at and say, it's whatever, you're, you're fine, it's not medically needed to do that. So, so if they can manage to get the care, the once they get the care, it's too late. That, like medication wise, is that even that's not involved? Is medication prescriptions? Yeah. If it was administered in the hospital, yeah, yeah but if it was just a prescription or like it was on the medication, yeah. So it's challenging, and, and there are two tiers in Washington 
say it's a larger hospital, so a tier one, and they have to provide financial assistance up to 400 percent of that cost of that one. Here are two hospitals which are rural and critical access are uh, providing discounts and financial assistance. So it continues to be challenging, and again, we believe we're in compliance. It's our intent to be in compliance. What um, percentage of the population in Kittitas very high. qualifies for yeah. charity care? Yeah. And particularly um, in rural communities at 400 level, you, it, you are catching 80 85 percent. And in Washington State, you can't access that. So to the degree that you have retired folks who own their homes and live good lives, and yet it you know, and, and don't have a Medicare supplement, so they would have out of pocket this kind of thing. Um, they would clearly qualify. Yeah, based, based, based on income and assets, <laughs> they can be assets very well off if they don't have a income stream. But I know we've talked about this every year, you know, back in the 19 and 2020 and 2021, like uh, Bob was talking about over there. So uh, <laughs> every year it goes up more for us. The law drastically changed July of 2022. Right, yeah. yeah. But uh, I know back in 2021 and 2020. It also goes up based on the poverty, as the poverty right. rate changes every year. Yeah. Actually changes, but then the law changed. Uh, it is you know, different and a lot more publicized. So uh, the, the education is out there. Do, do we think so as well? So, of an issue due to the pandemic that a lot of people uh, changed what they were doing in their life and consequently they don't have the, uh, the money or the insurance that they needed. I don't think the uninsured rates necessarily changed. Washington yeah. still does a good job of offering plans, but to John's point, your plan can leave you with a $15,000 deductible. And plans over the last 10 years have changed to have that out of pocket max significantly higher. Ten years ago, ten thousand dollars out of pocket max was probably totally unheard of, but now it's average. So, but if if restaurants offered free food if a family of four made less than ninety thousand, those restaurants would be fairly crowded, I would think. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is related to the question I was asking, though. <laughs> I mean, do we have evidence that people are gaming the system? Or is it just that uh, less is being reimbursed? So, I mean, I, I want to be a little careful. Are we blaming Olympia or are we blaming poor people? All right. I mean, this is what I'm trying to. So, to get I, I would on. argue one, one of the reasons we talk about uncompensated care and don't differentiate between bad debt and finance, charity care, financial assistance with a bright line is because people can't afford a week long stay in the hospital if they don't have insurance. If they do qualify based on some arbitrary legislation for charity care, it becomes charity care. If they simply can't make their house payment and get their kids to school and buy groceries, it becomes bad debt. We bundle bad debt and charity care together and call it uncompensated care. I think to a certain degree, based on legislation and the, the economic environment, just move between those two buckets. In this case, there really is, I believe, a disincentive for people to go out and purchase coverage that perhaps they would otherwise have said, I don't want to be there. And now they're looking at this saying, well, you know, I, I can get these discounts. In. State has absorbed the risk. I can't imagine it being intentional. Oh, the hospital. Well, well, yeah, but and then yeah. handed it back yeah. to the hospital. Yeah. It, People don't break their leg on purpose yeah. just to the I mean, we're talking medically necessary yeah. care. So, right, I mean, it's what I'm trying to say is it's complicated. I think we have to be a little careful to just assume that there's this horde of people out there who are just waiting to break their leg and getting the, you know, right. trying to gain the system. I'm not sure that we can assume that. I think that. I don't think anybody is assuming that. Okay, well, that's, well, that's good. Yeah. I said you should. <laughs> Scott and his financial counselors, I mean, we have navigators now that we are training and who are certified to help people get on plans whenever we can get them on plans. Because folks that are getting, are, do not have coverage are still hopscotching 
looking for services, to your point about pharmaceuticals, they're not going to be able to get their prescription. They're, you know, it, they're not it, a private practice isn't, it, that does orthopedics isn't going to set that like for free kind of thing. So we want people to be in the system so that they get a good continuum of care and don't start every journey through the emergency department. Yeah, I mean, because you can see how it's right. going to drive people to the emergency. Right. Yeah, so. well, if we don't, well, if we didn't, yeah, it would, if they didn't get uh, primary care, it would drive them to the emergency room and that would drive up costs more. We'd have to treat them anyway because of Antala. Just to be clear, I'm not frustrated with the people that want to use this. It's no different than when you pay taxes and you want to use every loophole in the IRS document. I'm frustrated with Olympia that created this such that we have to solve their problem now. And I don't consider a family of four making 90,000 a year to be poor, but they meet the demographic for this new law where they can turn to the hospital after they get services and say, oh, I, I'm not going to pay this share because Washington state law says I don't have to. So we provided the service. We paid the employees to, to do that, the facilities, all that. We didn't bring in enough revenue to cover that cost. And I fear in a few years, it's going to be in the millions of dollars as word spreads. Because why would a logical person pay for a low deductible plan if they're with well within this demographic if they get the exact same services by getting a high deductible plan, their premiums are much smaller. And when the rest of the bill comes in, they just hand it back to KBH and say, thank you. Well, I think we need more data. I, 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 I'd be Listen, interested just to be hear. clear, I'm not, I have nothing wrong with the citizens using the law because the law is there. Just to be clear, I, okay. everyone wants good care and they want to pay the least amount they can for good care. Well, so I get all that. I just think we need more data. I, I'm not sure there are all these people who have, you know, who have no income, million dollar houses. They're making or they're making eighty nine thousand nine hundred nine. You know, I, I just I would like to see the numbers to know exactly what's going on, rather than just assuming that there are people who are just desperate to to take advantage of this loophole and wait until Olympia passed it and then just pounce on hospitals to get medically necessary treatment. I just I just don't. I need to see more evidence, I think. We are required to provide, so any elective services for primary care visits, ambulatory setting, for if they're self-pay, so they don't have insurance, we are required to give a, a quote for their services before their services are provided. So that does, and our red cycle team does a good job of providing those quotes, and then we always ask for a down payment or even a payment below the front. So that's, that's a way that's, and that's a requirement of this, that law as well that we provide that quote and we can ask for down payments. So, does this uh, impact anything like that private urgent care we have here in town? Uh, somebody shows up with that urgent care, uh, do they have to uh, follow the law the same as uh, as uh, our ER or something like that? They're not a hospital. Uh, right. So, that does drive it. Uh, so, they Others in town can select their So patients. if somebody goes to the urgent care uh, for a thing, they can just throw them out on the curb then? Well, yeah. they can require payment. They do require payment. Probably. Okay, okay. So then they could go uh, very heavy on collecting the payments. Uh, okay, all right. Yeah, that's not any, I mean, that's, that's always been Yeah, they require payment. Yeah, I was just interesting though. Okay. Because uh, uh, if some of those businesses got damaged, it would actually increase uh, the force on, uh, on, on a lot of us other ones. I was just written for hospitals. So, but I, I, I agree with Matt. Over the next couple of years, we'll learn a lot as the numbers come in, and maybe they'll flatline immediately, and that'll be a wonderful thing. And maybe they won't. But ideally, it'd be nice for uh, for Olympia to revisit and at least. Can confine it to your area that you're it's your district and where yeah, I don't I mind less supporting local community residents than people coming from other states who hear I come here and get a new it won't cost me anything out of pocket. Yeah. So, I wonder if this also has to do with all, all the baby boomers that are out there because uh, our uh, population is getting a, a little bit older than it used to be historically. You said the income requirement. Is, do you know if that's AGI or net? 
So, but there are advocacy groups out there that are pushing this, pushing this through the media and pushing it through the attorney general's office to make sure that hospitals are in compliance and following the laws. Um, the last sort of regulatory issue that we're dealing with um, uh, is the reproductive privacy at, uh, at today that Hospital CEOs have all received a letter from the AG, have met a couple of times, wish I had ADHD, the collaborative are all involved in helping us respond uh, to the AG. We have a letter that's due in by the 15th. Um, so more work on that tomorrow and on Monday so that we can move that up. Um, it's acceptable for a, I feel like we've discussed this before, but remind me, for a prospective employer to ask their prescription Perspective providers, if they will, are willing to perform. So you just have to shot in the dark whether you are staff. Yeah, you you cannot condition employment based on whether you incentivize it. No. The, the uh, language and statute is you cannot discriminate in employment okay. based on willingness to participate. I don't know how anybody plans staffing, but it seems fascinating. Question. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to mention is that the legislature is in session. Um, there's a one of the asks that the hospital association has is a um, substantial assistance for rural OB providers, and I just want to call out that Tricia has prepared a white paper for us that really details the additional costs that we're incurring as a rural provider, including anesthesia, first assist, the nurses that we, we keep here, um, and the pediatricians that we have to have for neonatal uh, acute newborn call. All of that, she did a great job of summarizing that for us. It was disseminated by me. I sent it out to Wisha and, and the collaborative, and that way it's being um, used in the the legislature. So we're looking to help get some funding there. Thank you, Tricia. Thank I shared you. it with the health plans too. Regents and Premier. To get some help with those right. foundational costs. So. And there's also some interesting, and we're trying to figure out what the impacts are going to be, but the Washington Association of Physicians Assistants last year um, managed to, uh, ARNPs and PAs are are treated very differently under Washington state law. And PAs got a little bit more breathing room, a little bit more autonomy last year, and they're looking to expand on that this year. So we may see some changes in the way that's handled in that. But they're off and running. It's a short 60 day session. All right. I'm happy to answer questions. Other questions for Julie? Lots going on. All right, thank you, Julie. Um, Anna Scott, the uh, HR staff development, uh, pages uh, 32 and 33. Anything you want to call our attention to, Amanda? I don't have anything to add today. Thank you. I'm open for questions if anybody has any questions. Amanda, I always um, like to look at that difference between the median and average time to fill, and I don't recall it ever being the difference being this impressive, do you um, didn't see anything in your narrative that would describe why that's so wildly different? Do we have some really lengthy bills out there? Um, we did have some. Um, I don't have the exact positions, but that is that is what happens with that when there's an outlier. It's good news is okay. usually um, we've actually made some progress with several RN positions. Uh, this was actually in December, but um, Jason actually filled his financial analyst position and um, some other key positions that we've had open um, that we've been working on. So, um, yeah, that's uh, that's that one's a very tough metric because we we kind of want that number to kind of spike up <laughs> randomly when we have hard to fill positions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda, do you have your do you have the metric sheet in front of you? Uh, yes, I just had it. Hold on. Let me pull it up. What is your question though, John? I'm, My I'm, question is, uh, an employee population, the top uh, graph, 
we've got four columns of information. I just want to know how to read it because the last three columns are all 23 hyphen a month. And I'm, I was assuming that was the year, but then the, the, the first column is 21 hyphen November, which would make that 2021, which doesn't make any sense. So what does 21 dash November mean? It's probably the weekend, <laughs> the week of day. I would say like the 21st of October. No, I think it's a typo. Yeah, I think it's just a typo. It's, no, but it should be. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a typo. My apologies. We've, oh, um, no we're, just, we're rushing on. My brain on. locks up when I can't make sense of numbers, so. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Other questions for Amanda? All right, thank you very much, Amanda. Uh, then we have this expansion project update on our locker on pages 34 to 43. Ron? Yeah. Well, on the, the project cost deck, um, it's pretty much the same, but it did go down a little bit. We had a negative change order to change out some seed and tile. They had specified a large amount of tile and areas that didn't need to be in that put down in a special cleanable tile. It's, Really, just meant for central sterile, and they had applied that to the areas. And the contractor caught that. So, negative change order is very much for you. Uh, we probably had seven or eight. Um, and then on the project schedule, I had the eight days behind schedule. That's now back to about four days. So we had some adjustments in in several places, really, but also in the very end of the project, we have another project where we put new surgical lights in the existing ORs, and we had that concurrently with the expansion project, and it really just extended that schedule and extended our cost because we had to keep them on board. So we let them finish their project, and then we'll do the lights. And so we were able to. Get an adjustment there. Left back to four days. Um, just as an update, where they're at right now, the, the roofing is all but complete. Uh, so that by Monday, all the little details taken care of, and the material materials off the roof. So that'll be done. So that's nice. And then we'll be in the dry completely. Um, next week, they'll start the, the exterior finish on the building. So they've got all the the board up and so they'll they'll start the final finish on that it's a kind of a stucco type of a finish they call it ethos if water came in water incident in a lot of water yeah it was constant um but you know in some areas on the slab it really didn't matter but where it came up next to where the new building butted up to the existing building it was problematic and so you know we had one rainstorm where it was going into the surgery corridor and the women's locker room. And so we had to come in at night and get that covered up with some more plastic. So it wasn't a pipe bursting or anything like that. It was just external weather. Yeah, they had um, torn off the, the cap on the parapet wall of the existing building to tie in the new and, and the rains came. <laughs> yeah. But that was all cleaned up right away and, and made. Um, let's see, uh, all the equipment is up on the roof that happened uh, this week. And so that crane work is, is done now. So, and the third floor modifications to that room up there are done. So we're going to reopen the helipad on Monday. So that'll be back in service. And we get, um, if you remember, right, we had to take one of two water mains down in order to build a building. That water main is now reconnected in, in, in service. That's kind of a little update there. Um, <clears throat> when they tied into the existing building, we found two areas that didn't have any fireproofing on the, the steel decking and then the steel beams that are up there. And we should have had looked at the old code and, and there's just no exception why they should have everything fireproof to begin with or exceptions in the new code so we have to go back and do that so we have a little change order for that 
Um, other than that, I added a little section that I'll tracking unintended incidents and, and water coming in under the end of the surgery area is one of the incidents. Uh, the other one was the, the patient monitor that they have in outpatient surgery and they demoed the electrical behind that construction wall. We disconnected power to that monitor so we can get that on the board. Instead of that, it's, it's been pretty minimal. I was curious, you know, all the water lines that you, you're, we're going to be putting in to the different areas, are you putting that up? Because historically, we were able to have hot water always running around. So when they turned on hot water, so that way they needed hot, cold water to wash their hands or something. They didn't have to stand there for a while to wait for the hot water to come up. Are, are we still doing that so that the water lines, they can immediately turn on the hot water yeah. and have hot water right away? Yeah, they do that with their recirculation lines. So yeah. you kind of go to the end of the line and you take a line and you loop it back from the hot water tank. The pump just moves it so it's, it's always hot. So everybody will have a, Hot water, if they need it, if they turn on the hot water, yep. they don't have to wait a long time for it to, to travel a long ways to get to them. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. And if all goes smoothly, when will they be done? Uh, right around the first of May. They're on track for that. The fire marshal had talked to. Wade, who's the job superintendent, and he had some concerns about giving us occupancy, and he wants to see basically the entire new structure finished before he'll give us occupancy. But there's some phasing there that we have to do, so we're going to have to meet with the fire marshal and get that worked out. So I, I'm hoping there's not going to be any wrinkles from that. I want to manage expectations. In May, we will not be done with the entire project. There's still a lot of phasing work to be done inside, including. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> so, done and dusted in May, right? So, yeah, but, yeah. I just meant that. So, a lot of additional work will be done. And how many so, weeks or months for that? The, the entire project goes right to the end of the year. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Phase one. And uh, the MRI, is that um, on track to? Yep. yep, it's delivered March 26th. You'll get the CT delivered March 28th. Uh, do some testing for the MRI. Um, so we've got to fire up our, all our equipment on the roof, the major air handler, chiller and stuff like that. And then they'll come in and they'll do a vibration test in that room and that will mess up the images. And so we've got to go through that process. And then they also do a, a shielding test and they'll wheel beds by in, in that area to make sure it's not messing up the images and then adjust shielding if need be if the tests are bad. So other questions from the Do you want me to show your pictures? <coughs> like your own. Oh, all right. Well, so new new area. That's all new area. Yeah. Uh, exciting. That's all the rest now. That's where some of the new equipment has gone this week, or uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That big sheet metal box there on the roof. There's now a big unit sitting on top of that. And you continue to have a positive experience with Walker Construction. Yeah, yeah. I'm going backwards. Sorry. That's all right. It doesn't matter if they're in that's a particular order. What part of the structure are we in right now? What's, what's the area? That's central sterile. So okay. that's, um, yeah, right really close to the east edge of that. We'll add some drywall or something at some point in the floor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can see there's open up. So yeah. <laughs> there's some water in there, but as long as it doesn't go into the big section, we're good. Any other uh, questions for us? 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Rob. All right, next up we have operations. Uh, stepping in for DD tonight is Jeff Holdman. Yeah. So, uh, uh, DD typed up what you want me to say. Now, uh, I'm going to stand. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stand and do an oral presentation. Uh, uh, so, uh, one of the things that I, I noticed that wasn't on her uh, submitted information was, was um, you know, regarding the RPG award that we got. Um, I don't know if you guys were in attendance for that, but that was that was a pretty cool deal. Dr. Owens was pretty excited um, to receive that award on our behalf, so that was pretty cool. So um, uh, that's the first award they've ever given out. So and it was kind of an honor for us to receive it. So that's pretty stinking cool. Um, as far as the notes about um, some of the staffing for med surge, I do want you to note that um, I actually have hired two night shift CNAs to start next week. So I'm pretty excited about that because those, as you're aware, as I've spoken to you guys previously, that that's been a challenge for me um, to try to get someone to work those positions because of various circumstances. But uh, we've actually had two hires and I have some actual applicants to review, which is exciting for me because it's been a ghost land for six months. So what do you think changed? I'm not 100 percent sure. I'm not 100 percent sure. Um, I talked to Stacy and OB yesterday. Uh, she's seen a lot of uptick in applicants as well, so I'm not exactly sure what is driving that change. She had eight applicants for the same job, so uh, that holds well, I think, going forward to hopefully get some more applicants into the system that we can actually get some hires. And I'm super excited that um, that new staff development person was hired. It's going to be in charge of that CNA program. So that's really exciting, too. Um, the other thing I didn't see on Phoebe's notes was that um, we had a meeting at the end of the year with staff development, all the patient care directors, and also um, um, cardiopulmonary. So we, we met with Carolyn, who's the director of that department. And um, we have planned out uh, code blue practice for the whole entire year of 2024. And it's going to take place in various different departments to get more um, practice for those people that don't necessarily um, see it on a day and a day basis, like the ER potentially. So we're going to have um, we're going to have some, like there's going to be a practice one in in, e, in ER of course, but there's also going to be one in like the cafeteria, um, and there's going to be one potentially in the hallway and potentially in lab and radiology and various departments that aren't the standard where the codes happen, but we have to be able to do it effectively in those areas too. So we thought during that meeting we tried to be. Um, Try to think proactively as to where those potentials could happen. Um, historically speaking, we've had people fall, you know, visitors fall in the middle of the hallway. And so we want to be able to, if those situations arise again, can we actively respond appropriately in a timely fashion to those off areas, right? Because, you know, you come to med service, there's a code card there, but you fall in the middle of the cafeteria, there's no code card, right? So, so, so can we improve our practice? to those off areas as well as we do on the inpatient side, if that makes sense. So we board meeting. <laughs> when, you, when you do training like that, is everyone aware that this is a training thing or does it start know. some people thinking it's real? No, it's not. We don't, we don't tell them we're doing it. It's not practice. We pretend it's real. So they're not going to get advance notice of where that's going to happen or what day that's going to happen. It's going to come out of the blue. So. No pun intended. No pun intended. Well, I personally wouldn't mind ever being invited to observe one of these. I, I can touch base with staff development and and give you an idea of to when those dates are going to occur if you want to observe. Excellent. Absolutely. Can I just say we just had a code blue in the front of the hospital? Like we did. So we pulled them out of it, like they coded in the paper. And so like out of that, we actually ordered a backboard because lifting that person up onto yeah. the stretcher was Tricky. So yeah. this is, I actually think it's going to be super helpful. Yeah, that Uber driver was stressed. He literally just drove away. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> we're probably shaking as we were just like, what, what, we were shocked when they drove away and there were she's like we were taking an Uber to lunch. Yeah, yeah. Five star rating. Yeah. 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 Oh. They, they did an amazing response. Amazing. I happened to be walking in the South Albany School, which I was an yeah. amazing senior yeah. when it came. Was the person in this restaurant they got into the Uber? Were they taking the Uber to send it? I don't I don't know all the history, but I don't think so. So my understanding was they had, they were going to lunch. Okay. And then on the process of getting picked up and to their destination, there was a condition change of that particular okay. patient. The, and the Uber driver said, Well, this is not good, and drove to the hospital. Right? Rightfully so. Yeah. He did the right thing. So and then um, it then all the activity started after that. So yeah, business model for Uber. <laughs> no, it's not an Uber ambulance, right? No, no, no. He was just trying to take them out to eat where they were out to go. So, um, yeah. So, so that's super. Um, I think that's going to go well. So, there's one scheduled every month for the month of 2024, and I think there's actually one month that has two because um, I think we're doing it 13 times based on. What we kind of came up with our plan, and um, and um, John, I can certainly give you some kind of heads up as to um, when those are going to occur. Yeah, I don't want to be disruptive at all, but it'd be, it'd be fun yeah. to just kind yeah. of see what uh, people do. Could you refresh it? I would. Yeah, <laughs> I'll do my shift. I think. <laughs> yeah. Talking about the PCTs and such, um, do an update. I, I want to say that this was in Seattle. All the courts we went to when the keynote speakers spoke about what the the top ten careers were for students, senior students, say ten years ago, things like doctor, lawyer, nurse, that sort of thing. It just says that they didn't even make the the count this year, and it was all these like Instagram influencer or YouTube influencer, and it just made my heart sick. I had a student come up to me this week and say, "I went to the KBH. What was it called?" Uh -huh. This, where, where we invited the students in, yeah. and this student wants to go into medicine in some way or another, not an influencer, wants to actually help people. And I just, so it's a little feedback loop around here that that's- There's another one of those coming um, in a week and a half or two that, um, that they put together, and it's a different group of students from a different school system, so. Yeah, so we're, and we're seeing Thorpe and Kittitas mm -hmm. and Ellensburg, yeah. so we're reaching out to- it's Maybe yeah. they're listening. And, and we have potential opportunities for these people as they leave high school before they. We have apprenticeship. So yeah. if there are uh, opportunities. We we'll also have the CNA program going yeah. as well, and that they can come right out of high school, get into that CNA program, and we will help them get licensed and help them get employed. So it, it's going to be a nice program. I'm excited for that. Right, your short commute, no need to go. Right. Big city of Kyle has been doing a great job of getting students back and volunteers back. And excellent. Well, we're partnering with Central and maybe able to use some of their same space for CNA training. Ooh. In their new building? Mm -hmm. Very nice. I haven't even seen that yet. Great. Um, yeah, and um, kind of keen off what was in earlier in the packet, the ER has been extremely busy. Um, which I, I, you saw that data that they have uh, substantially increased their patient volume, which is um, I think before, but I, but I know that that's uh, been trying for them. Uh, yeah. Anyway, do you have questions about anything else that you see there about um, what BD has provided? Um, Any additional questions for Jeff? The, uh, the urgent care mentioned on the middle of page 44, that's the Cleo office? Yes, okay. yes, sir. Speaking of the emergency department, um, I think you're referencing Julie's report that yeah. you have 27%. I mean, the two of you or anybody else in the room, do you have projections a year from now or five years from now, what we're looking at for EDUs? It's leveled out some. I mean, it, it climbed. Um, Dr. Schnelzer and Cody have asked us to think in, in terms of preparing for a 70 patient a day load. I think that's a ways out there. Um, their request comes in the context of the ED and ED expansion. 
is not on the board for the next three to five years. So what can we do? What should the volumes that, you know, what's the, what do we need to be planning for? But um, we saw a steep increase. It stayed there, um, but it has kind of leveled off now at that new high. So have you seen anything in the December? December was a little lower than our peaks and Yakima residents coming up was a little was a lot lower. So I would just look at weather and be surprised if we had less coming up from Yakima. I don't in think few months. any of us think we're gonna go back to the thirties. We're, no. we're looking at forties, But is it still accurate the acuity is higher overall than it was a few years ago? The patients that come in or is that I can't really speak for the acuity care. I mean, I can't speak with it. That's always been. Yeah, it's not. We're not catering to the urgent care crowd. Yeah. That's not what's making up that increase. I think it's behavioral health. Is so I think what we're seeing is probably bimodal, where there we are seeing more high acuity patients, but at the same time we're also bordering. Supporting more patients or holding psych patients that are essentially very low acuity. Um, so I, I think if we look at the aggregate, it's going to be a little confusing. I think we have to break it out. So the average there would be a dangerous number. So yeah. low, low acuity, but a high resource with those. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to put in a block of ice and a foot in a bucket of oil and water on average would feel pretty good. Yep. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to highlight was kind of the social service section um, with the addition of the new hires that DV was able to get into that. Uh, social service department, I think, has um, thankfully helped expand some of that services because of the, um, the work that was being put on that one social service person that we had a day was a little challenging. And so, CARES department and ED or Stacy's department, OB, were not seeing as much uh, face time with that person. And so, now with that additional staff in that department, it's made that a lot more um, beneficial to OB and to ER when the social service visits. And they've also been able to do some, um, those social, the new additions have been able to do some FaceTime interaction with the surgical service department as well, to interact with some of those patients that might need help from them in that department as well. So been able to branch out that social service touch to more areas than just the immediate med surge and ICU. And so, um, so that's been really nice to expand that stuff. Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I've read that if the county population exceeds 50,000, we lose our rural um, status. Is that true? And that how will that affect the payment structure if the county loses rural status? Uh, is that uh, is that the case? I don't believe I I believe it's the city that they would be speaking to. So um, it's Skagit was the they actually led the way to having that increased a few years ago, but it's on the radar. Okay. Right. Anything uh, left for Jeff? Thank you, Jeff, for uh, coming and representing. Uh, next up, we have Rhonda Holden. Rhonda, I see up there, um, Chief Ancillary Officer. Her report is on page 46. Anything yes, you want to call our attention to, Rhonda? Yeah, I have just maybe a couple of additions. Um, Kittitas County Nurse of the Year, Kara Henderson, is working on her BSN and doing um, clinicals with our hospice nurses for her community health rotation. So it's been fun to have Kara. Um, under wound care, we have posted a position and are interviewing for a patient service representative, and she's received really excellent training from Elena Swan um, in the clinics as uh, the development coordinator there. It's been really helpful. So she will start working with the GNP program next week. And then, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, I got those mixed up. The our PSR is for GNP is the one who's been training with Elena, and we are interviewing for the wound care PSR. And then we also did have an MA start for the GNP program. And so we're really excited to have the support 
for them and think that we will be able to really increase the number of patients that they're going to be able to see now that they have um, this kind of support. So that's all I have. Do you have any questions for me? Under the pharmacy, the COVID vaccine, is that being offered in the clinic and also in the hospital? So that way we use up those vaccines. So if somebody's in the hospital, uh, we used to offer them a flu uh, shot uh, before they uh, were discharged. We're also offering a COVID vaccine also. I know we are in the clinic, Jeff. I don't know if you're giving out any in the hospital at this point. It's not common, but it's part of the screening process. So every single patient that gets admitted, similar to like when you were still working in pharmacy, sir, all, all those patients that get admitted go through a screening process. Um, CERN has a built-in uh, immunization screening tab. And so you ask all those questions to all those patients that you go through and you talk about COVID influence and pneumonia, um, uh, hepatitis, you talk about um, all those all those potential that you can help immunize immunize some <clears throat> patients by their quote unquote captive audience. So we do ask those questions to every single patient that gets admitted. Okay, thank you. And if they do qualify, yes, we absolutely will give them that vaccine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any uh, other questions for Rhonda? The the new mobile MRI is doing okay. We've had a little snafu with the, the gurney. Um, the gurney that they provided us is 79 inches long, but the opening is 77. So we're having to work with them to um, get another gurney that can go into the MRI. And so in the meantime, we are limiting uh, scheduling patients to those who can walk or be in a wheelchair and not require a stretcher. The other challenge is the other challenge is it's it's width. Um, uh, Cody and I met um, uh, and kind of helped to work out some dynamics with that. When when you take the current stretcher up and actually go to wheel the patient to the examination table for the MRI, there's it, it's so much wider than the previous stretcher was that you can't actually help transfer a patient safely from the stretcher to the MRI bed. Without potentially putting yourself at risk of harm, just because the reach is so far. Yeah, away. because um, let's say hypothetically this this table was the examination table for MRI. You wheel the stretcher here, Ron, and I would sit, and the space that you could actually stand on and help do that transfer is so minimal that you would have to do an awkward position and potentially hurt your back uh, trying to help transfer that patient over. So there's a there's a space constraint within the MRI examination area itself, and what and what Rod is alluding to on the left is the 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 MRI uh, the stretcher is longer than that lift is, and so it's it's very uh, it's not safe for the patient. What is the answer? A potential solution to have more negotiation room for the transfer so, or a narrower uh, what Kimmy has done is she's reached back out to the company that provides I'm sorry if I'm speaking for you Rhonda uh, <laughs> Kimmy has reached out to the company that provides that trailer and asked them to provide us a different stretcher she's measured that area um, and provided those dimensions to the MRI company and said we need something that's going to actually work for us there um, are good solutions they just aren't here at this point Right. Right. Well, we have these issues in the new MRI room in the expansion project. Okay. That MRI actually has a detachable table, so you transfer you do that transfer outside of the room, and then you and they stay on that same table when you bring it in. Okay. Yeah. That makes so much sense. Right? That's never occurred to me before to do something. We're excited for it. Very nice. Any other questions for Rhonda? So is Andy Dunn done and Andy Shaw? Because he's still going to work at part time, or is he done? Okay. Done. He's just and has such a good reputation in the community. Done such a good job as a provider. We pitched it really, really hard to That's Andy, but grandkids just 
are decimating the workforce. It's, it's just a really good provider. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be missed. Okay, anything else? All right, thank you. All right, next up, we have uh, Dr. Oppie, medical staff. Oh, I'm sorry, Stacy. Uh, my my mistake. Stacy, Chief of Clinic Operations. The uh, I thought I missed your report because people were talking about Andy. Since I've completed this report, we've had two more MA apprentices complete their certification, and we have a few more who plan to take it this month. So once those staff members complete that, we'll pull together a celebration for multiple apprentices and make sure we invite them. But um, to date, I think we've had 27 MA apprentices go through the program. So, um, I've got nothing else to add, but I'm open for questions. Do you guys have any questions about uh, the agent report or the DASH clinic operations staff? I think we have asked you guys to kind of take the temperature in the community and neighbors and friends and contacts about our phone project so that we can do a 12 month sort of look back on that at the meeting at the end of January. So if you could look that there over the next 30 days. So Although my about, neighbors and friends are not shy about telling them that I'm waiting for you to ask. So. A ton of work has been done on that. And we just kind of like to get some uh, feedback from the person. And we want their experiences, their most recent experiences. Yeah. Maybe better. No more than a month old or a couple months old? I would say a couple months. Look at maybe the last quarter of the year. Okay. Ready? May I loop back on uh, my previous dashboard? My apologies. Um, I want it, if that's okay, if I have a moment. Sure. I, okay. Is this related to what uh, Stacy's talking about or is it separate? No, no, it, it, was, uh, it was about recruitment. Okay. Sorry. Could, uh, could you just hang yeah. on for one uh, yeah. quick second minute? And we'll come back to it. Uh, Stacy uh, and uh, Julie, uh, regarding the phones, is is there going to be a presentation at the end of January or do you just yes. want to yes. repeat that? Okay. I can do a presentation. Okay. It's going to bring you up to speed a lot of physical movement of people answering the phones now being co located in the annex and how we've adjusted things. We just want to know again, this was a very board driven, community driven project because of the frustration. People try and get a hold, particularly of family medicine in Ellensburg, and we want to know you're still getting those nasty phone calls and people knocking on your front door. And, and we'll to we need that. to do an earlier board member uh, meeting and have a live call. Just put one speaker to... phone. Let's just <laughs> test her out. See how it works. Um, any other questions, comments for the station? Well, we look forward to that presentation. Thank you. Uh, so do I. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Stacey. Um, and Amanda, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you now if you, if you have a second. Okay, my apologies. I could put it in the chat too. I lost access to my report um, earlier, but um, on the, I did want to mention the time to fill question for Erica. We actually had a position that was open 900 days. Um, it was an ultrasound tech. And so I wanted to mention that um, uh, couldn't quite get fast enough under Rhonda's section too, but that was exciting for her area. And then 700 days, we had a posting for um, uh, surgical services RN under Amy's. So there was some good progress there. So, and the typo was uh, a typo. So thank you. My apologies. And those positions are now, now filled, is that? They are, yep. And those were in November, a 900, 900 day posting and a 700 day posting. So and, we're and making like some progress. Like we asked Jeff, what do you see changed all of a sudden? Do you have a sense of what changed? I uh, do think there's applied? a few. Yeah, I do think there's a few reasons. Um, I mean, we are seeing the market stabilizing. Um, if, and kind of what we predicted, uh, there is a, a, quite a movement, I think, of uh, traveler staff kind of going back more to regular assignments from what we have heard. Um, I do think our wage proposals. And since we had our last meeting, we we were able to work with Teamsters and negotiate the $18 an hour minimum wage, which was great. That impacts um, Jeff's team as well. And I think people have been kind of spreading the word that that's, that's coming. So I do think there's a few things, but um, 
it's it's just been a shifting market and our apprenticeship programs uh, like we talked about earlier that has been huge. We've been doing a lot more community education about those getting, and we're looking at a phlebotomy one next. We've, we're talking with Katie Bellotti about that. So um, yeah, I do think there's a few things that we're doing to get out there, but we also can't control everything that's happening in the market too. I think there's just a lot of fluctuation. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of unrest, I think in Yakima still we're hearing, uh, we are getting quite a bit of um, applicants from that area continued. So those are just a few things we've heard. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for clarifying that uh, for us, Amanda. Did you see that uh, Rhonda had thrown a question? Uh, so Rhonda put a note in the chat. What did uh, Rhonda? She said that she also has a long-term PT position. Okay. That's been up there. Yeah, right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Uh, thanks for that addition, Amanda. So next up we have uh, medical staff, the chief staff, uh, Dr. Oppi, I saw that there was, you put in the chat that- yeah, uh, said just having some IT problems, nothing to add. So nothing to add to this, uh, uh, to this list of, of initial appointments and reappointments. Um, this is, uh, was approved by MEC to forward to the board for our approval. Mm -hmm. I think everybody here has had a chance to review all these, all these files online. Um, Move to approve if you're looking for a Yeah, move to approve. Uh, do you have anything to add, Dr. Wright? Okay. Uh, and do I have a second? Second. All right, second from Erica. All those in favor of uh, approving this list of initial appointments and reappointments, please say aye. 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 All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoppy. Um, okay, next up we have uh, our CMO, Dr. Martin. My report starts on page 51. Um, I did mention that uh, we were the inaugural recipients of RPG's Excellence in uh, Partnership Award. Um, during the presentation, they began to describe the typical recipient of the award, and we replied that the typical recipient is KVH. Um, That's it's the inaugural. Right. <laughs> They have approximately 80 entities that they deal with. Yes. So it's not like just to have two others or something. No, like and uh, they did share that there was one other organization that uh, was seriously considered, uh, but the, the team that works with KVH felt strongly enough that they were able to persuade the other voters. Uh, so it was, it was neither uh, a small end nor a cake walk. And again, I would just like to thank Tricia for her attention and continued liaising with RPG for us. She knows whether these docs are Coke people or Pepsi people, make sure that, you know, that when they're handing out patients, they're welcome. So, um, and meets monthly with the group. So she's really been the liaison between operators and RPG. The other thing I wanted to draw attention to is just what we've seen in growth. Part of it is uh, as we brought more of our processes uh, in house around privileging uh, or credentialing with payers, I should say. Uh, but we've also gone over the course of two years from having 166 providers in our database to 271. Uh, so there's a lot of volume of work. One of the things that uh, payers are doing is they now require every provider record to be updated every 60 days. Which is why you see numbers that are so huge compared to the number of providers. I suspect that the updates to the provider database, uh, there's a couple of artifacts there. One, I think they're counting keystrokes. Um, uh, that's the only way I get to a million. Uh, the other is that with our previous contracted service, uh, there were a lot of things that weren't updated appropriately. Um, and so uh, Shannon and her team have been going through and really scouring those records and, and making sure that they're current. And in an environment where Medicare is denying payment, if there's a difference in punctuation and an address between the claim that's submitted and what's in their record, having those accurate, current, and consistent is really key. So in the, um, Julie's, Summary. Is that the one that 
pulled out the potential. I, is AI doing this on their end? And yeah, so, so what we're hearing is, and this is among collaborative hospitals, and, and you've probably read and heard really about some pretty egregious behavior on the part of Medicare Advantage program. And that's, and we don't actually contract with any Medicare Advantage program. Humana. Humana is the only one because of their bad behavior. Um, but they have programs that are going through and rejecting up to very close to 90% of all claims for first all based on algorithm and down Are there um, AI services available to us that can compete quite back against their AI? Well, uh, you know, uh, on our Kaiser journey, one of the things we did, you know, Kaiser was automatically, more or less, uh, automatically downcoding our emergency department visits. Um, we picked up the phone and called them and said, you can't do that. It's inappropriate. And they said, we don't care. And I don't think I'm overstating it. it was no, it's going to try to get you on any technicality possible or even uh, technicality and just delay, delay payment or not pay. Yeah. It's, and I think even Jefferson Hospital had some of the med advantage plants make contracts with them, say we were contracted as a network and they tried to pay a network prices. Um, we don't have that here, but we do have, they make it really difficult to, to get paid. They require a lot more data, they'll deny and say we need further documents and then we have to go do a request for information from our department and get further <coughs> sorry, information uploaded. This causes further delay. And we also believe that once those claims have been rejected, there's and we appeal them, that they're sitting on those appeals for months and months and months before they reprocess. They, they absolutely put us into a queue and they say, okay, we got a paperwork now, you're in a queue to reprocess the site or staff. And then they deny it and it's ultimately patient responsibility that we get to be the ones and send that out to the patient ten months later, whatever. Yes. To Julie's point, when we were going through the issue with Kaiser in the emergency department, you will probably remember that Scott came in and asked to contract with a service that would help analyze our coding in the emergency department, and we contracted with that service. They were guiding our coding. Kaiser was using the same algorithm and claiming that we were exaggerating the charges, and it's <clears throat> the only explanation is that they weren't putting the same data in that we were. They don't get enough data on the claim to actually be able to accurately code. It is becoming more blatant. And um, I, I, this is the first time, and, and this goes back to the biofire test that Dr. Martin mentioned earlier. Medicare owes us an appeal process, and it's all that in statute. That how they have to respond when we say no, this and they completely ignored that. I don't believe we ever received a response from the Medicare program before they called back all the fought back all the men. Um, so it's just, and again, you'll hear that they're short staffed. This is old stuff. We're getting caught up because of the pandemic, and uh, more and more of it is automated. But if we're down 2%, I think I call that in my report in terms of reimbursement. That's $5 million. Is there a statute of limitations for people saying we're still dealing with COVID uh, ramifications? I, I haven't seen that <laughs> so far. But it is, you know, again, it's good to have someone like Scott, uh, whose task now it is to chase the 1% and chase the 2%, because that is real money. And too many people are leaving that, taking no for an answer and moving on. And I think that's what the plans are handling. Do we reach the point with Humana that we did with Kaiser, where we say we're not going to contract with you, or is that Medicare Advantage we, we different? Could, and we were there in 2019. We actually submitted a termination to Humana, so and they they've been playing well since then, up until then. recently. No, Humana's still doing okay. Oh, no. yeah. Humana's fine. Uh, they do have one off things. They're responsive. They work. Well with us, they have about 600 lives covered in the county. Uh, we do have other med advantage ones 
the Greer County traveling or they purchase a main advantage plan not knowing that it's out of network for Kittitas County? The so, VMAM is only in network yeah. one in this county yeah. if you live here. Yeah. So those other ones for people who have purchased other main advantage plans and then have came to KBH, we then have their information. We all, we've met, mailed them all a letter to say you are out of network and here's a referral to our local uh, insurance brokers to help you find an in-network plan that you choose. So we're trying to do some public education there too. Because they don't know and they just get a list of here's all the men advantage, let me choose the one that's only contracted in Connecticut. And the, the other issue that's had with Humana isn't reimbursement, it's discharge. Um, Humana will not contract with Prestige services and they won't do single bed contracts. So any Humana, con Humana patient that gets admitted uh, and needs skilled nursing leaves the county. And we have to coordinate that discharge and it's a more difficult discharge to coordinate. Humana is, uh, we had some administrative terms they were giving and I started talking to them like six months or a year ago about it. And I insisted they pay us more than Medicare to accommodate for that administrative charge. And in February, they'll start paying us 2% more than Medicare. That's kind of what we win. And they recognize those as an emergency place for it. Working with the plans too, it changes kind of turnover like us and I'll get a new contract in person, then they're or we'll work with them. We did it one very good one, but it really goes back and forth. Uh, thank you. Uh, other questions for Dr. Martin about is there anything you want to add? Perfectly. It was it was useful for me and in kind of a year summary. It's perfectly uh, now. We grab we've, spite. We've had, with all the challenges we've had over the year, it was useful to sit back and look at some of those numbers and acknowledge that we actually have made a start. I need to remind myself of that as much as I can. And a session of the internal and adult medicine. Mm -hmm. We have a new doctor starting next week. Correct. And it looks great as we have one uh, who's accepted the position that's going to start in April. So we'll be able to back up locums a little bit. And some of our patients who have a lot of churn with the providers they see, hopefully we'll see a little bit of stability there. And, and we're also looking at a couple of APCs. Uh, we have uh, one that we should hear back from shortly, one that we just interviewed for us this week. Uh, we have additional interviews down the road. We have a total of five interviews in January. Uh, but yeah, I think we're going to start seeing a decrease there. Additionally, as OPHG staffs up, uh, we'll stop. We'll see a decrease in, in uh, locums for family birth in place. So it, we aren't out of the woods, but the trees are getting a little thinner. And there seems to be a bottomless <laughs> demand. Well, and and there's over depending on which estimate you read, somewhere between fifty and one hundred twenty thousand. Physician vacancies nationwide right now. And when uh, the journey that ultimately brought me here started when uh, I met Don Solberg and we were working on addressing what was a looming uh, shortage of primary care physicians in 2005. And at that time, the teaching was that you know, we ought to be putting 50% of the graduating workforce into primary care. And if we didn't graduate another anesthesiologist until 2025, we'd still have a flood. That's no longer the case. Um, nationally, it looks like we lost nine or ten percent of the physician workforce, nine or ten percent of the nursing workforce, uh, a greater percentage of the PT workforce during the pandemic. And I think for a lot of folks that had worked hard and uh, have their retirement squared away, they decided that this was a good time to hang it up. And that's not a, a local problem. That is, uh, I get any number of newsletters daily talking about that. And I think it was Manda's report or uh, we no longer bother saying workforce shortage, we just say workforce and the shortage is implied. That second provider to control, I think that's yeah. April. That's not. 
We have another one starting this week. The second one is still pending. Uh, going through HR. The second one. What does that mean? We have a signed contract? Or we have a signed letter of intent and pending HR processes uh, present a contract. Any other questions for Dr. Mark? Thank you, Dr. Mark. Next up, we have our CFO, Jason Adler. Jason. Thank you. Uh, so November financials, just kind of go through the bullets here. We did have another significant loss in November, 448,000 operating loss. Uh, thankful we've had really good investment income this year that brought things up to just our $42,000 net loss. But we're still sitting year to date at a 4.3 million net positive. So we're still getting stronger date. The last quarter though has been, been tough with the all the victims and definitely cut bridges. So we did have still have a lot of writers on FMLA, uh, open gaps and long comes. So our, our clinic visits are still below budget 10%. Uh, inpatient average length of stay. It still remains below four days. A lot of the work on the utilization review team has been really appropriate in classifying the patients since there's been some change in the education there. It seems to have changed that patient status back to where it was expected to be. And days cash on hand decreased to 201.9 days in November, and that's, that will continue to decrease with the expansion project. And then it'll decrease significantly in December because we'll have our debt service payments plus the expansion project. So I do project cash to continue to decrease throughout 2024, and I'll go into that in the budget narrative. Uh, financial highlights below driving this loss, like we've been talking about, it's been significantly lighter collections this year than the previous few years. That's really what's driving that loss. So we Despite being $1.2 million over it right now, we still have a significant loss due to collections and, and managing expense. So uh, throughout 2023, we've been really investing in professional services and strengthening our bench strength there. So emergency associates at Yakima, Evergreen Anesthesia, OB Hospitals Group, and the Physicians Group. This has driven a real profile change on our income statement from salaries down to professional fees. And a lot of these partners are really an investment this year. And I feel like we're highly leveraged and positioning ourselves well for 2024 and 2025 after the expansion projects completed. So I think we're getting our stuff together to be able to provide that service and use that expansion. In the meantime, the income statement is painful. It sounds cool. Uh, well, there's good things in it too. So the supplies have been exceeding budget, and that is exceeding budget due to excess in surgical procedures. So we have in November alone we had 38 procedures more than budget, and year to date we've done just under 300 procedures over the budget. So surgeries way exceeded their budget. I mean, that's that's the idea. It's like no, I'll just. Uh... As many as many services as we can provide, and as much as we can provide, it just seems like the demand is there. Yeah. We just can't. <laughs> I don't know what we're supposed to do. It seems like we're just chasing something we're never going to be able to get. But anyway, and with surgeries, the GI volume has increased very significantly this year, um, and that's despite all the plastic walls, fake walls, the water coming in, and playing musical chairs in the surgical services department. Lot. Really large increase. Um, that's all I have on the financial highlights for November finances. Do you have any questions on the stats pages or the rest of my narrative? Any questions for Jason? So, uh, even though our uh, day, uh, money day supply has dropped down, do you still feel that our accounts receivable days are doing well? It's been steady, so we're 67 days. It may have went up or down by one. Um, and Scott's really focused on front end work right now. So he's rounding, and, and the patient, the patient financial service staff is rounding with our PSRs to really talk about what needs to go into 
the EMR at the time of registration so that then they can have a more streamlined process for our automated process. Because then so we might be able to, to collection. decrease account receivable days some due to so. Scott. hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's where Scott's focus to, to work that, um, not just decrease it, but collect okay. it. That would be good that we get the, the, the accounts receivable day down so the hospital gets the buckaroos uh, yep. uh, a little bit faster. Yep. All right. Thank you. Other questions for Jason about this? I should have a handout of the budget or budget. I just want to go through my financial summary there in the bullet points. And I think I we both talked about 2024 budget expectations, but it's also a really recap, I think, of what we've been experiencing in 2023. We roll into 2024. So 2024 budget will have a $16.5 million increase to charges. It's mostly driven by a charge master increase of 5% for the facility and 3% to professional services. 5% is the limit that we can do for our missile contracts. Uh, the market for increases across facilities is exceeding that. So if you've been to another facility or seen on the news like UW Medicine with Primera, UW Med termed Primera because their contracted percentage increases are covering inflation. So UW, Premier are trying to work together, they turned, and that's really common this year in the contracting negotiation phase. So all facilities are experiencing inflation greater than being allowed. Uh, 2.75% two two of the budget is increase in growth operations still, which is about $7 million of that half million uh, in the budget the mix of inpatient and ob status i realigned back with where we were in 2022 uh five percent increase in volumes to er ambulatory clinic mri and ct with a two percent increase to the other imaging modalities lab rehab services and i, I projected just a no change to surgical procedures gi or deliveries uh, I, I hope that Amy will be able to pull off the musical chairs and have no change, but I think she did a goal filling all the meeting locations she did in this year. Uh, FTEs increase, it goes from 613 current year is where we're running year to date. Average, our month of November, we were 623 FTEs, and it'll be 650 is what's projected at the end of the year. Uh, collection rates, as we were talking about earlier, have been very difficult throughout 2023. So our collections are currently at 52.8%. That's a decrease from 56.1% in 2022. So that's for sure mm -hmm. $4 million, or 4% would be seven to eight million dollars. Um, and I expect that to be carried into 2024. So hopefully we start seeing some improvements there from the payers. But some of this is driven from legislation. So the 2020 legislation created a rate cap for the remote clinics, and that caused a lot more cost to go not allowable, basically. So we've lost that on, on what was our safety net. Now we have that cap. All of our HC clinics do exceed that cap. So we do this opportunity. Uh, legislative change for financial assistance, so that increased nine hundred thousand dollars over twenty two, and then a general increase in inflation of professional fee services, provider services are generally non allowable costs on the transfer report. So these are all things that are driving down legislative changes that drive down our reimbursement potential, uh, and then the other bullets are just a general approached by the insurers to cause more difficulty to be paid, even from the insurers we talked about earlier, but even Medicare uh, last month did an update improvement in their system to make our, our claims providers demographic information must exactly match what is in Medicare's ecosystem to the point of if, if somebody's last name is hyphenated and we don't have the hyphen, it will deny if their address 
is abbreviated with a street versus spelled out a street, then we'll deny. So it has to be an exact demographic match versus what was created was that to match on NPI number to have one unique NPI per provider is what it used to match on. They, they're not using that anymore, I guess. So, um, and then additionally, I guess just have to mention just the filling office does challenge with attrition, recruitment, or retention of staff as well, like all other areas. Uh, so all that should end 16 half million in charges growth, projected to have 7 million in revenue growth of that over 2023 annualized. Projected increase of 5.6 million in expenses. And we tried to really put intentional effort for all the increase to go towards staffing professional labor services and really trying to maintain our official services and our supply expenses. So you'll be able to really see that shift on the budget in your statement. Um, temporary labor is decreased reflected in the budget, but that is offset by salaries increases. So I do budget for those positions, but I don't budget for them in salaries and temp labor. I try to do an incremental increase in the temp labor to cover that total. Uh, and then I was just talking about staffing and temp labor. So PBH has experienced a slower return of employed staff, like Anna was talking about, or getting applicants. But at the same time, with legislative uh, creating that paid family medical leave absence, we used to have at any one time about 20 staff on FMLA. The date that that PFMLA started, our average went up to 20 to 80 or 70 to 80 staff at any one time time on FMLA. So those are ones that we can't be planned for. A lot of them are intermittent leaves and they really cause significant disruption of services. And that's about 12% of our total staff. So they're all those intermittent leaves. Uh, professional fees. This is just talking about real profile change to our income statement. So let's see expecting 2024 about 7.1 million in pro fees. That's our evergreen anesthesia, OBHG, rural health, rural physicians group, emergency associate of Yakima. And then that's up from 5.2 million in 23 and 2.7 million in 22. So you can see that grow threefold there. Um, supplies expenses. And the idea is that, uh, well, is this, uh, let's see. Is, is the idea that this is going to keep going up? Like, I have, uh, uh, no. Okay. Not as fast. Yeah. yeah. So, like, emergency associate Yakima was a shift from labor employed, we employed five MDs to cover 24 7. Now we shifted all of that from salaries down to professional fees. And instead of employing five, we have a pool of, I think they have 17 doctors to pull from. Um, Excuse me, they're up over 20. Yeah, so it's really strengthening our, our bench strength to provide continuity of care. Um, if we have somebody call out now, it's not a significant, it's a significant event anytime, but it's not, it's not as it's catastrophic. It's not a catastrophic event if somebody calls out, say, they just call somebody else and they come in. Um, and it's the same for anesthesia. If we don't have two people in the room, then we have 11 more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean that's nice, but uh, be, yeah, I mean it would be nice to have, you know employed uh, like not locums and things. Yeah, these are not locums. The yeah. cost we're talking right. about here, yeah, right. services. Yeah, the contract, the contract is similar to RPG. Yeah, yeah, I get it. In those professional fees, seven point one million total. There is some of that is locum. Too. So we still are running hookups in internal medicine, our GMP, pediatrics, women's health. But yeah, we so we have but we have contracted services now with uh, what rehab, OB, uh, the ED, uh, anesthesia, and radiology, and pathology. Yeah, it seems like a lot, but I guess we don't have any choice. Anyway, all right. In every one of those. Our first option was to try to employ. Yeah, but yeah, I know. in a workforce that 
this hospital does fewer deliveries than one of the obstetricians I trained under annually. And to maintain what the current work board sees as a sustainable call burden, I've got to have six names in the call room. I've got the OB volume to support one. Yeah. Um, the only way to make that work is to be able to contract with somebody where they can pool the labor force and distribute it because I can't afford the staff uh, market wants. Oh yeah, that, yeah. And I, and I realize that this was not your first choice, but your first choice, especially around OB. Or, um, it's, it's, uh, is there ever any worry that, that we're sort of at the mercy of these organizations? Like if they decided to vastly increase their costs or something that we would basically be stuck. I, I, I don't know how many options. As opposed to individuals too. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, we are yeah. at the mercy of the market. So. But that's, that's, you know, individuals, this is a sort of collective, like the whole department would, would come to a standstill if they said. You know. But I think we have a fair amount of lead time. It's all based on contracts. So you have some warning that they want to make a significant change and kind of negotiate. Uh, it's uh, uh, minimizing your concern. No, it's, all, it. it's an absolute worry. And yeah, we do have contracts. You know, OBSG, it's a three year contract. So we we have that contract for three years. So rates are set for three years. So yeah. That, now, you know, is there a worry of honoring it, filling, fulfilling the contract? Always. That, yeah, all right. That happens. But I will say, you're in good company. I think um, our chief of staff and our vice chief of staff would ruminate with you about that. I think they're concerned about the number of contracts or services and and how large that number represents in terms of our active medical staff. So, yeah. But if I can take you back 20 years to when we didn't employ or contract for all the services and we had competing private practices in town, we had a similar dynamic. So it's definitely a, sh a shifting market and it changes the dynamic. But whether we're contracting for the service or employing it directly, we are going to be at the mercy of the market. Yeah. And I think the other thing that is incumbent on us acknowledging that is I think we've done a very good job of choosing partners. Uh, the reason we got that award from RPG is they are as invested in our quality as we are. And uh, I you know there was uh, an anesthesia group that uh, I don't think was as good a partner. Uh, Evergreen uh, has shown a willingness to work with us when there's a quality concern that comes out of the operating room. They're responsive. Don't act like they're going in. I'm also, I mean, I'm mindful of the fact that the board tells you access, access, access. Don't get rid of this service. Sort of go, we sort of say, go ahead and take care of it. So I realize that, you know, sometimes this is the only option in order to do that. So I, I understand that. We build the ship while we're out in the water. Yeah. Well, we say build the ship. Yeah. While we're out in the water. But if we do it from the wreckage. Of so, I, so I'm I'm aware that there's uh, that um, that the reason you're doing this is because there's no other option in order to accomplish what we have prioritized. So I understand that. I I really do appreciate what Dr. Martin said. Though we have not fallen into these relationships, we I think we picked really good quality companies. Uh, and I think too, it's it's going to allow some of the growth that we want. With like anesthesia is an example. It's expanded the ability of throughput that we just couldn't do under the old model. And, and speaking of anesthesia, so is it my understanding the contract guarantees them so much they do their own billing. So in theory, it whittles down them. the contract. I mean, yeah. our out of pocket goes lower as they grow, expand, and do more billing. Is that accurate? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last two bullets there is just supplies and purchase services. There is a small decrease projecting in the 2024 budget. Uh, if we realize that decrease, that would be wonderful, I hope to. And that supplies decrease related to all the work materials is doing to really standardize all the products, contract negotiation, and, co and pricing compliance to our purchasing organization. 
merchants. So they're finding a lot of opportunities there and purchase services is down. There was just a lot of purchase service expense in 2022, 2023 related to IT services, uh, old legacy systems that are being backed up and then we can terminate those contracts with legacy systems. And then some interfacing services that have been done the last couple of years. And then I did really work with every director to examine their purchase services to really make an, an effort to optimize squeezing everything they can out of the resources they're getting or look at alternatives or terming their services. Uh, so all this resulted in a 2.9 million operating income for 2024 plus the non-operating income, which is mostly investments, would be a 5.1 million net income for the year. And then I just did a little cash projection there because we're going to see cash coming down a lot 2024. So I think every quarter meeting I'll just bring up that it's, it's expected to come down. It's the project being built. We borrowed 15.3 million for the project. So all that 15.3 will be spent, and that 15.3 is included in our day's cash calculation right now, plus the other 15 million in the project. Let's just be ready. Come, yes, come down. Every day's month. cash on hand is going to come down. To, a, to the level that is still <laughs> enviable. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, uh, I remember being in, in Chelan at some of the wishy meetings and talking to other people about, about this. They, they're like... Yeah, we're, we're going kind of week to week here. Yeah. You know? yeah. So we were the, we've been the envy of, of other hospitals. Anyway. Yeah. We were up to about 250 days cash by the end of 2024. Project about one. So the third page there is the, the numbers behind all the words of this. Okay. So do you have any questions on that? Budget for the statistics on the next page. Any questions? Just the, the growth over the last few years. In 2020 to 2021, we increased expense 11 million. Next year, increased 14 million, another 14 million. And next year, projecting a more modest growth at 5 million in increased expense. Any other questions for Jason? Because uh, at some point, I'm going to entertain a motion. But uh, before I do that, any questions? Oh, thanks, Jason, for I know the work that goes into this is uh, extensive. So thank you yeah. for all that behind the scenes. So the motion is for the board to adopt 20.4 operating budget as presented in the handout that can be summarized by. Total operating revenues of $136,527,545. Total operating expense of $133,727,545. There's also an operating income of uh, $2.9 million or 2.12% operating margin. I came up with that off the top of my head. <laughs> I didn't get a script. That's, that's good. All right. So, anyway, would someone like to make that motion? Okay. All right. Motion from Erica. Second. Second from John. Any further discussion uh, questions for Jason? All right, then, all those in favor of uh, that motion, please say aye. 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 Thank you very much, Jason, for all the work you did. I appreciate it. And thanks Thank for uh, walking us through it uh, so clear. Thank you. Any, uh, any other questions for Jason before we? It does feel a little weird since we're doing November financials in January to just comment on December to at this point. So December revenue. I didn't anticipate to be at budget or potentially below budget, so I would expect the loss to continue through December. Okay. Yes. All right, get ready. And how are the first four days of January looking? <laughs> hey, hey, all right. Yeah, good. Can you yeah. annualize? Oh, can you annualize, Jay? Uh, <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Jason. Uh, is Michelle here? She is not. She's been at Disney World. All somewhere. right. So we have uh, Michelle. Michelle's report. Any uh, anything anyone wants to talk about? All right. Oh, I, I'm gonna. Uh, uh, no, I just wanted to say that her report. I really like uh, Mitchell's upgraded narrative. Yeah. It's wonderful. It's yeah. really nice to look at it and um, 
Can you say something else so I can check you on? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, appreciation banquet, was there talk about moving that to a different time in the year or is it going to stay in December? The survey that came back was overwhelming to keep it right around the holiday. Well, before we go past this, I just want to take a quick poll. How many people here uh, were voted best nurse in Kittitas County 2023? <laughs> hey, uh, anybody? Oh, yeah, actually, Chairman, congratulations. Congratulations. That's great. Thank it's you. great to see that in the announcements. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and we have, uh, and the runner up was uh, Tammy Zabik. Did I Zabik. Get that? Zabik. Zabik. Um, so I just want to. Uh, mention her as well. This is great. First and second. Anyway, thanks for coming and thank you uh, for all the great work you do. Thank you. All right, Education and Board Reports. I just want to remind everybody that later this month, uh, Bob and I and Dee Dee are going to the Advocacy Days in Olympia. We're going to have a, a, a session, a Zoom session, so that we're up to speed on exactly what we'll be talking about there. And uh, it'll be nice. It's nice to know that Tricia is maybe uh, shaping that narrative that we'll have for the legislators. I think uh, also Terry, because of his committee work with uh, Wisha, may may be there as well. Um, so uh, we will report back after that. Uh, I don't know if that's is that going to be before or after our January. <laughs> <Do you remember? laughs> after. 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 Okay. All right. So the report may have to wait till February. Um, no old business, no new business. A question. Yes. I saw in my email earlier that you and Dr. Larson are doing some sort of a uh, League of Women Voters. So I think it's on the 24th at 7 o'clock at Hal Holmes, and he's going to talk about the importance of trust in public health. And I'm going to plagiarize some of Dr. Hoppy's uh, work that she did on our medical staff and talks about the current state of health care in Kid with Ask Can that be a Zoomable thing? Or I don't know. I want for more details about that. I, I think I want to make sure it's recorded. So. Oh, you managing the. Yeah, I, I'll, yeah, I'll talk to the league because I think it should be captured for the public. So. If it's not broadcast, then you can just FaceTime me. Yeah, it won't be live, but it'll be on video on demand after. For, for later. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you. Uh, anything else before we go? Uh, how long do we need? Have about 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So let's take a uh, just a uh, let's take a five minute break until uh, 7:13, okay. then we'll do. Let's say 17 minutes just to make things even until uh, 730. So we will plan to reconvene in the open session after that. There's no uh, no action. No action expected to be taken after that. Um, okay, thank you all. And this uh, open meeting then is, is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.